Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. We are slowly getting closer to that 5,000 subscriber mark, which means the drawing will be soon. One of you will be the lucky winner of $100. Stay tuned for more instructions. Of course, down below in the description, please check out the Back to Ashes and Phoenix Fire Narrations merchandise store. If you like what you are hearing, you can also buy me a coffee. It would be truly appreciated as much as I appreciate you. If you would like to become a member of Back to Ashes, it's only $1.99 a month. Perks include early releases to videos, special shout out at the beginning of every video, priority comment replies in the comment section, and much more. If listening to sleep stories to help you fall asleep is your thing and you are new here, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell to all. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For when we arise from the ashes, we are a better, stronger, and happier person. Sit back, relax, or tuck in and get warm and enjoy these true, backwoods, creepy stories set to the ambiance of nature's real rain out in a forest or the woods. Okay, so first off, these stories are 100% true. Most were told by family and friends through the years, along with some of my own encounters in the rural mountains and ridgelines of my county, of course. As with all creepy stories to give you a good scare, take them with a grain of salt. However, I must still say that these stories are as real as me sitting here writing these. I hope you all find these as interesting as I do. Here is some background. I have grown up in eastern Kentucky for several years since the age of one. My family, both sides, have grown up in the rural Appalachias their whole lives as well, but, as with modern times, moved to the small town nestled here in a valley situated in between rolling hills and deep ridge lines. Where the following stories take place is a rural area nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains. It's got a name and it's considered a county. However, the area where my dad's family grew up is within this area and where these stories come from is more like a collection of deep ridges and mountain folks than anything else. Just to clear up any confusion that this is an actual town. During the early days of the settlers, these mountains were home to the Cherokee Indians. Many cemeteries in this area had actually around 30 to 40 graves of Native Americans buried there, marked with stones and rocks rather than a more traditional Indian burial routine in the 1800s. George Washington's aide-de-camp, Colonel Grayson, was bestowed upon him a 70,000-acre piece of land, which now is where my local town is located at today. Here is story number one. In the 1970s or 80s, my mom and her aunt along with her small cousins, were driving on an empty road just outside of town where they created the top of a mountain where an abandoned farmhouse stood. They stopped their car in its tracks when they saw a massive, hovering saucer-shaped craft hovering over the house. Frightened, my mother and her aunt booked it out of there at a high rate of speed. Scared, they continued down the mountain back to town quickly. However, when they looked in the rearview mirror, they saw the craft coming after them at a high rate of speed, telling the car and keeping up with it. They attempted multiple times to evade the craft, but to no avail. It chased them for over a mile back to town until finally, just at the edge of the county road that leads back into town, it finally disappeared. 
My mother has told the story at least 100 times to family and friends, most of which believe her, as they too have seen strange lights in the sky in and around various areas of the community. Though some don't, she drew me a picture of the spacecraft a few years ago, which I still have. It's gray and most metallic looking by the way she drew it. It also has red lights on all edges of the bottom of the craft, along with a few green lights on the side of it. Here's story number two. When my mother was a child, old enough to know when something is going on, was at home with her parents and siblings one night. A man whom her mother and father already knew and were acquainted with barged into the house and scared out of his wits. He lived in a cabin deep within the woods, some miles away during his stay there. He reported poltergeist activity, orbs and paranormal activity within the property and house itself. He would go on to tell my grandmother that reportedly he was tormented all night by a demon who threw pots and pans, glasses, and even furniture at him. This went on for almost the entire night. It would throw them completely out of the cabinets, almost hitting him with it. Also reportedly started knocking and tapping on the sides of the house and thumping the walls and ceiling. Finally, he mustered up the nerves to utter the Lord's Prayer and attempted to rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. This seemed to piss it off even more, and causing it to become even more aggressive, and now would try to kill him with more heavier objects. He ran from the house and spent about seven to eight hours walking through the woods and rural county roads back to my grandmother's house. While on his way to the house, he reported that he could hear footsteps trailing him in the woods and next to the road, but he couldn't see anything. It continued on like this for several hours until he finally reached their house. Story number three. In the 90s, in town set a white brick house at the top of a small hill. A man and his wife lived there for several years. The man was in his 40s or 50s, and the woman somewhere around the same age, I believe. Anyways, one day, while my mother was working at a local gas station where the woman also coincidentally worked at, the man had called her saying that something was wrong with the gas in the house, and he was going to go look at it to see if he could fix it. The gas was located in the basement. He went downstairs and laid on his back and crawled up under the thing to see what had happened. He lit a match and immediately the house exploded, sending rubble everywhere and a massive fireball and smoke that could be seen throughout town lit up the sky. The man's wife, who saw the explosion from the gas station, ran home to discover the house gone and nothing left but its foundations. The man's body, as one might expect in a situation like this, was blown into pieces, with body parts even littering some neighboring houses. Since then, it has become a local legend that the man's spirit haunts the house that was built on the land where the one original stood. The show ghost hunters or maybe another ghost hunting TV series, actually filmed an episode here because of the experiences by the home's inhabitants. Everything from pots and pans rattling and stuff being thrown around to actual manifestations inside the residence. Story number four. Where my dad's family lives is up in a series of ridges and hollers that for the sake of this entry, I will call Webb, Kentucky. 
My dad's entire lineage has lived there since the 1800s. I have looked into our family tree, and it is chalked full of history. From an old one-armed Irishman who built the two-story log cabin where my father's family grew up and where his grandparents, my great-great-grandparent, lived at their entire lives to Native American heritage. Where the following story takes place is at my uncle's house, which is the two-story log cabin built by said Irishman. My uncle died in 2010 of a massive heart attack on his porch at the home, and most of the time it's since sat empty except for my aunt, my grandma's sister, staying there during the spring and summer. The house itself had had a history of paranormal activity, from disembodied footsteps coming from the upstairs rooms to voices and apparitions. My whole life, my dad and his sisters and brothers had always sweared that the house was haunted by the spirits of my great-grandparent, the one-armed man who built the property, and possibly even my late uncle who died there. But that isn't the only thing that has happened there. In the late 90s or early 2000s, somewhere around that time, My uncle, who loved spending time out in the woods, day and night, coon hunting, with his pack of hunting dogs, was out one night on one of his nightly hunts. According to my aunt, who heard the story from my uncle, who retold it to my grandparents later on, he was in the woods when something chased him out with great success. He said he could hear bipedal walking, tailing him in the woods. His coon hounds, who were akin to predators, seemed frightened and wouldn't chase after whatever it was. He fled through the woods as he heard whatever it was chasing him from behind. He barely made it home by the skin of his teeth, as whatever it was chased him all the way back to the property. He retold the story to my family a few weeks later while visiting. Here's story number five. My uncle, dad's eldest brother, had moved back to the mountains after some years away in the nearby city. After remarrying, the family kept up with him from time to time. But he said, on his own, and doing quite well, However, unfortunately, in the mid to late 2016, he was diagnosed with incurable lung cancer and was given only a few short months to a year to live. Seeing as how he didn't want to die in the city, he decided to move back to the hills of home. He spent a little while trying to find a suitable house or trailer to move his family back into, but... After a while, he finally found one nestled on a very steep hill with a gravel road. Leading up the hill to the house, it sat, surrounded by dense, dark woods, and a backyard that was walled off by a massive rock fence and even more woods surrounding it. The house was what I would describe as a log cabin type build with light brown wood covering the outside and tin or shingled roof. It even had a small hot tub off the side of the small porch, but it had not been used in quite some time. However, that wasn't the strangest part of the property. In the front yard, in a medium-sized garden that the previous owners had made, sat a grave. Yes, a real grave. It was of a stillborn infant baby, a fetus whom had died in the 1970s or 80s, years prior, and had been buried there ever since. I found that extremely odd and unnerving, but the inside didn't fare much better either. Whoever had lived there previously must have left in a hurry as they left all of their belongings behind. Dishes were left on the kitchen table, a TV, 
bed frames were taped together in the bedrooms with only the bed rolls themselves being taken. Little girl's clothes and a Minnie Mouse TV stuffed into the closet of a back bedroom. And in the backyard was the strangest sight of all. A massive burn pile made up of furniture and pieces of the objects and personal effects all scorched and burned black like a giant circle of black surrounding the pile signified by a black outline in the dirt. The whole house had a very eerie and creepy vibe to it like something was wrong there very wrong. My father, as the dying promised to his dying brother, started working on the house immediately, arranging for satellite TV to be hooked up in the living room, which is where my uncle and his family were forced to sleep at while work was underway elsewhere in the house. However, soon this happy abode turned into a living hell. Sleeping in the living room, you would hear footsteps walking across the wooden floors. Doors would close and open by themselves, and shadows were seen. My uncle started seeing a small boy and older man in overalls and straw hats, who, after a while there, would torment him even up until his dying day. His wife, who thought he was going crazy, never knew anything odd was happening. That was until, while at the kitchen sink, she saw a boy in overalls running past the kitchen window. Going outside, she discovered nothing was there. His daughter always soon started experiencing the oddness of the property as she told her mother that she had been playing with a boy in her room just a short time ago. When going to see what was going on, nothing was there. My uncle was continually tormented by these spirits, even locking my family who went to visit him in the back bedroom out of fear that they would hurt them. Eventually, however, they were found to finally flee the home, having been run out by all of the aggressive activity inside the home. My uncle did eventually pass away in 2017, but the entire time he was there at the home, he was tormented by the restless spirits of the man and boy. After his death, the family pastor and another preacher went to the property and blessed it, and attempted to banish the dark entities haunting the home. They threw holy water on the walls and front and back doors and ordered the spirits out in the name of Jesus Christ. After that, no one knows for sure if the property ever had an odd activity again. And last but not least, story number six. My father would stay the night at my grandmother's when she was still alive. She passed away in 2018. Most of the time, he would stay with her because she was afraid of the nighttime, as she had some form of sundowners and would see and hear things at night, so he stayed to calm her nerves at night. This particular night, her sister was visiting for a week, and he decided to go up and hang out with them for a while and stay the night. Well at about midnight or sometime after that. He was awoken by the sound of the garbage being gone through and a loud thump as whatever it was had knocked the lid off the trash can, causing a loud commotion that had awoken my aunt and my grandmother. As they got my dad up to investigate whatever the disturbance was out back, grabbing my grandfather's old shotgun and a flashlight, he opened up the back door and walked out back to investigate, having seen the trash can lid on the ground and the trash had been gone through. He walked further out through the back area to see if anything was out there. And then, that's when he saw it. 
walking back up the hill and back into the woods. It was a very large and very tall creature, in white, with red eyes reflecting the light from the flashlight bouncing off of it. The creature watched him the entire time as it walked back up into the woods as it vanished. My dad walked back inside, white from what he had just seen, pale as a ghost. My aunt tried to ask what happened, and that is when he told her and called my mom on the house phone. Relaying the encounter, my mother had my stepbrother try to find an odd encounters from the area and had found one. A man had reported being followed in the woods while he was walking away that same stretch of road one day. He never saw anything, but it was walking with him every step. It was later discovered that there is a legend there about the devil himself haunting the woods of the mountains of the Appalachian in eastern Kentucky. It was the summer of 1998, and I was on a camping trip with a group of friends in the woods of northern Maine. We had hiked for hours to reach our campsite, deep into the heart of the forest, and we were looking forward to a few days of relaxation and outdoor adventure. On the first night, we set up our tents and built a campfire. We shared stories and jokes and enjoyed the peace and quiet of the wilderness. As the night wore on, we settled into our tents, exhausted but content. Around 2 a.m., I was awakened by the sound of footsteps outside my tent. At first, I assumed it was one of my friends going to the bathroom or getting a snack, but the footsteps didn't stop. They continued to circle my tent over and over again, as if someone was pacing back and forth outside. I tried to ignore the noise and go back to sleep, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I unzipped my tent and peered outside, but I saw nothing but darkness and shadows. I tried to wake up my friends, but they were all sound asleep. I decided to investigate on my own, assuming it was just an animal or a trick of the wind. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped outside my tent. The forest was eerily quiet, with no sign of any living creature. I walked around my tent, shining my flashlight in every direction, but I saw nothing out of the ordinary. I was about to head back to my tent when I heard a faint whisper. It was so faint that I almost didn't hear it, but it sent shivers down my spine. It was a voice, low and raspy, coming from the darkness beyond my campsite. I couldn't make out what it was saying, but I knew it wasn't human. I hesitated for a moment, but then I decided to follow this voice It led me deeper into the woods, away from my campsite and my friends. I walked for what felt like hours, my heart pounding in my chest, my flashlight casting eerie shadows on the tree. Finally, I came to a clearing, where I saw something that made my blood run cold. In the center of the clearing stood a figure, tall and gaunt, with glowing red eyes and razor-sharp teeth. I froze, unsure of what to do. The figure stared at me, and I felt as if it was reading my mind. It sounded like it tried to whisper something to me. The noise it made sent shivers down my spine. I tried to run, but my legs felt like lead. I stumbled and fell, scraping my knees on the rough ground. 
I heard the figure getting closer, its footsteps crunching leaves, twigs snapping. I knew that I was doomed, that there was no escape from this nightmare. But then, something strange happened. The figure stopped, its glowing eyes fixated on me. I felt as if it was studying me, assessing me, and then it made that noise again. It snorted and scratched at the ground, and then it was gone, disappearing into the darkness. I was left alone in the clearing. Shaking and terrified, I stumbled back to my campsite, where my friends were still sound asleep. I tried to wake them up, but they wouldn't stir. It was as if they were under a spell, trapped in a deep sleep. I spent the rest of the night wide awake, watching the darkness and waiting for the sun to rise. When it finally did, I packed up my tent and gear and left the woods, vowing never to return. To this day, I still have nightmares about that night in the woods. I've tried to tell my friends about what happened, but they all just laugh and dismiss it as a ghost story. But I know what I saw and heard. I know that something evil lurks in those woods, and I will never forget the warning that was given to me. Years later, I read about a series of disappearances and strange occurrences in the same area where we had camped. People had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only their tents and belongings. Others reported seeing strange figures lurking in the woods at night, their eyes glowing red like the creature I had encountered. I knew then that what had happened to me was not just a figment of my imagination. There was something sinister and otherworldly at work in those woods, something that was beyond our understanding. I never went back to that place, and I never will, but I know that the woods are still there, waiting for the unwary to stumble into their grasp and I can only hope that others will heed the warning that was given to me and stay far away from that cursed place. As the years went by, I did my best to forget about that terrifying night in the woods. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination running wild, that I had been tired and delirious from the long hike. But deep down... I knew that wasn't the case. The memory of the creature with the glowing red eyes still haunted me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, lurking in the shadows. I tried to avoid anything related to the woods or the outdoors, but fate had other plans for me. I was working as a park ranger in a remote forested area, tasked with patrolling the trails and making sure that campers were following the rules. At first, I thought it would be a great opportunity to face my fears and overcome my trauma. But as soon as I arrived at the park, I felt a sense of dread wash over me. The trees were tall and imposing, the underbrush thick and tangled. It reminded me too much of the woods where I had encountered the creature. I tried to put on a brave face and do my job, but it wasn't long before strange things started happening. Campers reported hearing strange whispers at night, and some even claimed to have seen glowing eyes watching them from the darkness. I tried to brush it off as superstition or overactive imaginations, but deep down, I knew that something was wrong. It felt like the woods were alive with an energy that was dark and malevolent. One night, as I was patrolling the trails, 
I heard the same whispers that had haunted me in my nightmares. I tried to ignore them and continue on my way. But then, I saw something that made me freeze in my tracks. In the distance, I saw the same figure I had encountered all those years ago. It was tall and gaunt, with glowing red eyes and razor-sharp teeth. It stood motionless, watching me with a gaze that seemed to penetrate my soul. I knew then that I was in great danger. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't stop until I was back at my cabin, panting and shaking. I knew that I couldn't stay in the park any longer. I packed my bags and left, vowing never to return. To this day, I still have nightmares about the woods and the creature that lurks within them. I tried to warn others about the danger, but most people dismiss me as crazy or delusional. But I know the truth. The woods are not just a peaceful retreat, but a place of darkness and danger. And if you're not careful, you may find yourself face to face with the same creature that I faced all those years ago. So... I've been house-sitting for some friends in the rural PNW. They live up in the hills on a long, twisting road, and the house itself is at the end of a long gravel driveway. The house also sits up against a big, evergreen forest. I should also mention that at one point, the driveway branches off and goes into the woods, I have no idea why. I've explored in there before, and there's nothing. The road is too overgrown for a vehicle to get through anyway. Or, so I thought. Recently, it dumped snow up here, and I've kind of been trapped. As my gutless sedan doesn't have a four-wheel drive, and the driveway is covered in over a foot of snow, and the road hasn't even been plowed. Anyway, a couple nights ago, I was sitting up awake reading. I haven't been sleeping well, because I got COVID, and the coughing keeps me up at night. At about 11.30 p.m., I saw headlights outside the window. I could hardly believe it. First, It was late at night. Second, there's been so much snow that most cars couldn't even make it up here. And third, my friends are out of state, so no one else would be coming up here. Certainly not at night. I peeked out the window and watched as the headlights, instead of turning the bend in the driveway towards the house, kept going into the woods. Um, what? I was curious, but I'm also a coward. So I didn't do anything as ridiculous as follow the car into the forest in the middle of the night. But I couldn't let it go. So in the morning, I grabbed my boots and parka and stupidly left the house to investigate. The next part... I genuinely cannot explain. There was one set of tire tracks in the snow, heading down the rough road into the woods. I followed them about a half mile into the forest, and they suddenly stopped. There was a large fallen tree blocking the road, and no vehicle in sight. The tire tracks just... ended and no footprints were in the snow either. That's it. I wished I had an explanation or a better ending, rather than me running like hell out of those woods, but I don't have one. I'll be glad when my friends get back, because it is seriously creepy as F in these woods.
The woods had always held a certain allure for me. The way the sunlight filtered through the trees. The sound of birds chirping and leaves rustling in the breeze. I had always found it peaceful and calming. So, when my friend suggested a camping trip, I jumped at the chance. We arrived at the campsite in the early afternoon, excited to begin our adventure. We set up our tents, started a fire, and cracked open a few beers. As the sun began to set, we cooked some dinner over the fire and settled in for the night. But, as the night wore on, I began to feel uneasy. There was a sense of foreboding in the air, like something was watching us from the darkness beyond the trees. My friends seemed oblivious to it, laughing and joking around as we passed a bottle of whiskey back and forth. But then we heard it. A faint rustling in the bushes, followed by the snapping of twigs. We all fell silent, listening intently. I could feel my heart racing in my chest, my palms sweaty with fear. Then it came again, louder this time, the sound of footsteps crunching on the forest floor. My friends and I huddled closer together, trying to make out what was coming towards us. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was tall and thin, with long, spindly arms that hung down to its knees. Its face was obscured by shadows, but I could see its eyes glinting in the moonlight. They were empty, soulless pits that seemed to stare right through me. We all screamed and scrambled to our feet, backing away from the figure as it slowly advanced towards us. But no matter how far we ran, it seemed to keep pace with us. Its steps were slow and deliberate, like it was savoring the terror it was causing. As we stumbled through the woods, branches and thorns tearing at our clothes and skin, I could feel my mind slipping away. Fear had taken a hold of me completely, and I was powerless to stop it. But then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure vanished. We stumbled to a halt, gasping for breath, trying to make sense of what had just happened. But there was no rational explanation. It was like something out of a nightmare. The rest of the night passed in a blur. We huddled together in our tents, too terrified to venture out into the woods again. Every rustling leaf Every snapping twig made us jump with fear. And though we didn't see the figure again, we could feel its presence lurking just beyond the edge of our campsite. In the morning, we packed up our things and left the woods as quickly as we could. But the memory of that night stayed with me long after we returned home. I couldn't shake the feeling that something had followed us out of the woods. Something dark and malevolent that wanted to do us harm. Over the next few weeks, strange things began to happen. At first, it was just little things. Objects moving on their own. Strange noises in the night. But then, it escalated. One night... I woke up to find the figure standing at the foot of my bed. It was even more terrifying up close. Its empty eye staring right into mine. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I was paralyzed with fear. Then it spoke. Its voice was cold and monotone like a machine. You shouldn't have come to the woods. It said, Now you're mine. I opened my eyes and prayed for it to go away. When I opened them again, it was gone. 
but the memory of its words lingered, haunting me night and day. I tried to convince myself that it was just a nightmare, that I had imagined the whole thing, but then I started seeing it everywhere, in the corner of my eye, lurking in the shadows, watching me from a distance. It was like it had become a part of me, like it was inside my head, driving me to madness. I stopped sleeping, stopped eating, stopped leaving the house. I was consumed by fear and paranoia, convinced that it was coming for me. One day, I received a package in the mail. It was a small wooden box, intricately carved with strange symbols and runes. I didn't recognize the writing, but there was something familiar about it. Inside the box was a note, written in the same cold, monotone voice that had haunted me for weeks. Open it, the note said, or suffer the consequences. I hesitated for a moment, but then something inside me snapped. I was tired of living in fear. I was ready to face whatever was coming for me. So, I opened the box. Inside was a small vial of dark liquid, thick and viscous. It smelled like rot and decay, like something that had been buried underground for centuries. Without thinking, I lifted the vial to my lips and drank it down. At first, there was nothing. But then the world around me began to shift and warp. The trees outside my window twisted and contorted, their branches reaching out like tendrils of smoke. The walls of my house melted away, revealing a vast, dark void beyond. And then it appeared. The figure stepped out of the darkness, its eyes glowing with the sickly green light. It reached out a long, bony finger and touched my forehead, sending waves of pain and terror through my body. But then, something miraculous happened. The fear that had consumed me for weeks began to fade, replaced by a strange sense of peace and acceptance. I understood then that the figure was not my enemy, but my guide. It had been trying to show me something, to lead me down a path that I was too afraid to take. I don't know what happened to me that night, whether it was a hallucination, a dream, or something else entirely. But when I woke up the next morning, I felt different, stronger, more alive. I never went back to the woods again, but I carry that experience with me wherever I go. It taught me that sometimes the things that scare us the most are the things we need to face in order to grow and learn. And sometimes, the darkest horrors can lead us to a place of light and understanding. Once I fully understood all of this and watched as the entity slowly faded away, I felt my body being shaken. I opened my eyes and one of my friends was asking if I was okay. Yeah, I'm fine. What's going on? I ask. We found you out in the woods lying on the ground. You must have hit your head on something and fainted. You kept murmuring something about a creature with red eyes. You scared us all to death. We're glad you're okay though, said one of my friends. I was having the strangest dream. It felt so real. And it all happened right here at this camp spot. I trailed off as we all heard a twig snap outside my tent, and then heavy footprints. What in the hell is that? My friend said. Shh. I'll peek out and see if I can see anything, I said. I slowly unzipped the zipper to my tent, and my heart froze within my chest. Not even 400 yards away from the campsite, I saw hollow, glistening eyes staring at us from behind a tree.
Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forest and not many neighbors. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I had been a paramedic for about four or five years, and being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organization. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue, sometimes several, every weekend, spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bikes and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out on a helicopter or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky-ass trailer thing we'd pull with a quad. About two weeks after joining, and with zero training beyond what I had learned as a Boy Scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, they had put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours, then gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive. No more than 20 minutes, but we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams, then set off. They put me on a squad with the most experienced guy, and we headed out. The plan was for each two or three person team to take one of the larger trails that ringed the place. Then, after searching those, we'd systematically work our way into the shorter, maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search. None of that grid search crap. Just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly. Maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the F you were doing and where you were going or you never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were a crapshoot, and the maps didn't account for all the random trail riders would just sort of make. The only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put at the front of the group is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted, and just freaking done. We take a water break and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like the bike has been found, but no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. When we get there, The bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is very dead. 
Lips blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes looked to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, I could see that his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. This dude had been dead a while. It didn't make any sense, though. His bike still had gas in it. He had food and water and was a healthy guy in his late 20s. Why was he dead? It looked like he had simply laid his bike down, then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. We wrapped him up in blankets, then put him on the stokes and took him to the trailhead where the coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthymia secondary to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up to that point I had always assumed was Hollywood bullshit. I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or of being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird shit in these woods, but I've seen a few strange things myself so it wouldn't surprise me. This happened a few years ago and still haunts me to this day, considering how stupid I was at the time. Here's my true terrifying hiking story. As I stepped deeper into the dense forest, I felt a sense of unease creeping over me. I had foolishly decided to go on a hiking trip alone, despite my friend's warnings. As I walked deeper into the woods, I realized I had lost my sense of direction. My phone was out of range, and I had no compass or map to guide the way. I continued walking aimlessly until the sound of rustling leaves behind me caused me to freeze. Looking over my shoulder, I saw a massive grizzly bear looming over me, its sharp claws glinting in the dim light. My heart raced as I realized that I was lost and had stumbled upon the bear's territory. With no way to outrun the bear, I tried to back away slowly, hoping to avoid an attack. But... The bear seemed to be aware of my presence and began to charge towards me. I sprinted as fast as I could, my heart pounding with fear. I knew I couldn't outrun the bear for long and that it was only a matter of time before it would catch me. As I continued running, I tripped on a rock. My ankle twisted painfully. I fell to the ground, unable to stand, as the bear closed in on me. I then remembered something one of my friends told me. If you ever encounter a bear and it seems aggressive, play dead and it will usually leave you alone and go about its business. I closed my eyes, expecting the worst. But when I opened them, the bear had vanished. I could hear its growls in the distance, but it did, indeed, leave me alone. Trembling with fear and pain, I dragged myself to my feet and stumbled through the forest, desperate to find my way back to civilization before encountering the bear again. I had never been so scared in my life and knew that I had been lucky to escape the bear's wrath. As I finally emerged from the woods and located my car, I promised myself that I would never venture into the wilderness alone, ever again.
And that, dear listeners, is the end of these true, backwoods, creepy stories. I hope if you are sleeping, Slumberland is treating you well. And if you have listened to this while you are awake, I truly hope you enjoyed the stories. Until next time, I'll read to you all soon. Good morning, good afternoon, or good night.